05's Kiss Kiss Bang Bang film review and thoughts. Merry Christmas! Yep, technically this is a Christmas movie by certain standards, at least, and that's good enough for me. I am definitely going to swear in this video. I realize that's going to bother some people. I hope I don't come across as too sleepy in this. Last night I did sleep badly. Sleep bad. Not badly, otherwise it makes it seem like the mechanism that allows me to sleep. What? Fuckhead? Who taught me grammar? Badly is an adverb. I'm gonna get out. Vanish. I started this video with a review with zero spoilers. As soon as I end the review itself, please note that the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And yeah, the review itself will be based on the idea that the person watching has not yet watched the movie, even though I did just reference it. So the plot. In LA, Harry, a small-time crook who has gotten a foot in the door in the in show business, and Gay Perry, a private detective, try to solve a murder mystery and help out Harmony, an aspiring actress, with her case. Now, I'm not going to be talking too much about whether or not Gay Perry is offensive. I simply don't feel qualified to talk about it. Now, the, the core plot at first glance seems like we've seen it countless times before, but in ways I'm not going to get into in the spoiler-free review, it gets complicated with a lot of surprises. And there are a lot of tropes in this that are explored since Shane Black has done a lot of buddy comedy, police story, solving a mystery stories. The movie is constantly subverting expectations. There are just an unreal amount of things where you think you know where it's going. Like, you're sitting there like, oh, I get it. Yeah, I've seen this movie before. This is where they're going to, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. You know, you have my attention, thrill me. But then somehow it actually goes and does the opposite of what you expected and personally I don't think it ever gets old but I do acknowledge some other people do I will say not not everything about the movie is perfect but I would rate that you know on a scale of 1 to 10 on humor it's a 20 I've watched this movie maybe half a dozen times now each time I am just laughing constantly it's unbelievably funny now, so yeah, there are definitely plot twists in this movie, and it handles them incredibly smoothly. I would argue there aren't too many, even though there are some really major ones. I will say on the first viewing, it can be difficult to keep up with all the twists. You may need to check a Wikipedia plot summary after watching the movie to be sure that you got everything. You know, if that m means to you that the movie failed in that regard, then yes, it failed in that regard. But then... That is the standard that, you know, movies like The Big Sleep also fails. I would say The Big Sleep is far harder to completely keep up with. And when that movie came out, they did not have Wikipedia. I love that movie. I'm not criticizing that movie. But I do really empathize with people who watched it back when it came out and were trying to keep up. But, but yeah, I, will, I would say by the time the movie ends, you pretty much understand how everything went together. I, I wouldn't say that it's... I've seen movies where, like, you watch it and just afterwards you're like, what was that? I don't understand how that, how the plot goes together. I, you know, uh, as, a, as a quick... The first time I watched this, it was recommended to me by a friend, and he certainly seemed to have gotten everything on his first viewing. Again, maybe not before the, you know, by the time the end credits start rolling, you've pieced everything together. Also because, like, some parts of the movie move really fast, so you have to pay close attention to just follow even what's happening, even beyond, you know, you might not right away understand why it's happening, who's doing what or why, but you just have to keep up with, you know, what what exactly is the situation now. And, but, but yeah, you know, my friend had understood it, you know, then I watched it. 
without knowing any spoilers. I understood it. I showed it to my dad. He seemed to understand, you know, so, yeah, I, small sample size, I realize. Uh, what's, what's it called again? That's, uh, that's, crap, I forget what it's called, but, like, you know, I realize that's not, that's not a representative sample, that's not enough to, you know, but what I'm saying is, I don't really, I, I would say that you probably, you maybe feel like, wait, was that, how that, but in my experience, limited experience, you probably did, you just feel like, was that really how it went, because, because so much happens. I know that Iron Man 3 and especially The Predator had their problems, but I continue to really love Shane Black. And Michelle Monaghan in this really nails this balance between being this cute, sweet, innocent young woman and this cynical, harsh character. I've seen movies where all she gets to be is cute, which is really only a tiny fraction of what she's capable of. You know, I, I've seen several reviewers, you know, in researching for this review, I saw reviewers say that they were surprised that she didn't get more of a career after this movie and at least one of them pointed to well this movie didn't do that well and that's why and i think that's true i think she would have if this movie had been more positively received received i think she would have had way more of like you know i realize she starred in other movies since but i i haven't seen one that really let her show all that she's, you know, just how much she's capable of. And like many other things about this movie, the opening really surprises you. And I am not going to detail it. I am not going to give away how this movie opens. Because it really is, like, I, I refuse to, to give it away in this photo free section. If you want it given away, just it'll be one of the first things I talk about when I get to the into the spoilers. Or rather, once I get into the section that is about that that you know notes I took while watching, not not in the very next section. Anyway. Somehow, despite it seeming impossible before then, the ending manages to wrap up everything that has come before it in a really satisfying way. Again, when you leave this movie, you you just just exactly got everything. And the this movie very clearly comes from a place of love, as it kind of lampoons and just nails you know, the plot twists that are intentionally difficult to predict because they're written to be the sudden discoveries of things that are extremely important clues, the try-hard, serious, deadpan narration from the toughest nails detective. It's kind of a pastiche or maybe parody with homages. You know, it's not a huge surprise that a noir murder mystery has a narrator, but what you might not have expected is that Harry will rewind the film using magic marker to highlight something we need to notice and comment on tropes. You know, he accidentally tells stuff out of order, so he'll have to suddenly pause a scene. And like, this, you know, I read someone pointing out that this movie was especially good to watch in theaters because it literally is as if he's pausing the projector and you see the film stock, you know, moving slightly out of, yeah. And, you know, he gives us some background that we clearly do need, sometimes an entire new scene. And then he'll go back and continue the scene from where he paused it. And, yeah. Robert Downey Jr. plays Harry, and he does the thing that he's known to do, where he's kind of neurotic, fast-talking. He is incredibly funny and witty in this. His role in this movie can definitely be credited with getting... With you know him getting to play Iron Man, and this and or Iron Man got him the role of Sherlock Holmes, and Val Kilmer as Harry has many of the typical traits of an action hero, and he points out Harry's stupidity many times with great lines. 
you know, really the the entire the entire trio are really witty, and there's great chemistry between Robert Downey Jr. and Michelle Monaghan, and Robert Downey Jr. and Val Kilmer. And the dialogue is really sharp. There are countless great exchanges and quotable lines. Like, literally, just, again, if you don't care about spoilers, just go to IMDb's memorable quotes section, and there are just tons of them. And the movie has really great characterization. Now, this is the best satire or pastiche about this sort of thing that I've personally seen. It's possible that others, that even better ones exist, and I just haven't seen them. I do still think Murder by Death is also excellent. But, you know, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, actually, that one I've watched, I don't know, a dozen times, maybe. I guess somewhere between one and two dozen times. And showed it to other people, and they all love it as well. If I still had a working copy, I'd watch it again, but I wore out the VHS tape. Now, the cinematography is really good. The It really nails the, the genre, which, you know, cinematography is one of the things that first-time directors, this was Shane Black's first, you know, it was his directorial debut, Cinematography is often one of the things that first-time directors have a hard time with because it's not really, you know, it's it's the sort of thing that you do have to learn. It doesn't come naturally to, like, you know, if someone throws something at you, you might, like, try to grab, you know, either shield yourself or, or try to catch it in the air. That's natural. But cinematography for a film, that's... That takes training and experience, and but this one really gets and and the editing is also great. Like when, yeah, it's not exactly a spoiler. It's, you know, I already, yeah, I already mentioned that there's murder mystery stuff going on. So obviously there are killers. There are scenes of people in danger, and again, first-time directors can sometimes not quite get it right like the the with the with the cinematography and editing of scenes like that and it ends up not completely working not not quite being tense which you know when it's supposed to be and yeah this one does not have that problem there are not a ton of special effects but i do think that they do a good job of like you know, there's there are definitely effect shots where like I'm glad that they didn't feel that it would be wrong to do that as an effect shot. And there are not a ton of stunts, but they are really, really great. And we see several different places around Hollywood, and we do see some of like New York and this small town in Indiana. And the music is great. Now, the I'm to be more like this list compares this to Lucky Number 11, Source Code, and Hot Fuzz. I think I might have also compared it to some others, but those are the three I've seen. I mean, Source Code, well, Michelle Monaghan is in both movies. I'm not sure that I'd really say any of but anyway. Hot Fuzz is to action movies what this movie is to the, the noir murder mystery. So that's a fairly apt comparison. And I mean, I can't really say that one of these is better than the other. If, you know, like if you have a chance at all, watch both of them. Un unless the, the whole pastiche thing isn't for you, of course. But. Yeah, the, the, you know, both really, really great. Lucky Number Slevin wasn't really quite for me, but I will definitely say there's, yeah, you know, that one also has the, the really unpredictable twists 
and like really you know cleverly written dialogue and such and you know at first it might seem like the plot is fairly straightforward but then once you really you know as you watch more of it it becomes like there's way more going on than you thought and yeah you know I didn't personally like it but maybe you will and there's definitely you know yeah I, I would say if you like that movie I think there's a pretty good chance you'll also like this one you know it's, Lucky Number Slevin is also this sort of detective kind of thing more than, eh? Well, actually, yeah, Hot Fuzz is d a detective story, but it's not a noir detective story. As... Uh, all right, actually, I suppose there are aspects of noir in there, for sure. I guess... What I'll... Yeah, actually. It has elements of the noir murder mystery detective story in there. But it doesn't go, it, it goes more towards the the American action blockbuster as far as many of the tropes go than the, the murder mystery detective story where this movie, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, is entirely noir murder mystery. It has very little, you know, it, it has a few things. You know, Shane Black comments on some of his own movies and most of those, the ones he's written, and most of those are you know, action movies, and, you know, buddy comedy and, and such, but this one is the, where was I going with that? Where I was going with that, don't ask questions that makes it look like you don't know anything. Sorry, that's another reference. Where, where I'm going with it is that This movie is way more about the noir murder mystery than the American action blockbuster where, you know, Hot Fuzz focuses more on the American action blockbuster. And one thing I will say that I think it's, you know, it's not going to bother everyone. I'm not sure it really bothers me that much, but I can understand why it bothers others. The movie can be kind of tasteless in some of the violence, sexuality and such, and it really didn't need to be. And, like, one of the arguments against it is it doesn't really, like... Okay, to be fair, it's not that there's nothing like that in, you know old noir stories, but it's not quite, like, maybe part of it is also that a bunch of it is played for comedy, where in the noir stories, it tended to be played for drama, and that is kind of the thing when you do a pastiche of something that has really harsh material, it can come off as you're making fun of it. And don't get me wrong, I, some of my favorite movies are really, really, you know, movies that... <sighs> movies that, that a lot of people would say, you know, that's, that's too dark. You know, one of my favorite movies is Monster, another one is The Thing, you know, I don't... The Fly, the... the Cronenberg version. I haven't watched the original. I, I'd like to, but I haven't yet. So I don't have a problem with stuff that, you know, stuff that, that a lot of people find to be very, to, to be offensive or extreme or such. But I do think it might have turned off some people to it. I think there's a chance that the movie might have performed better if not for the, the you know, some of the more tacky, 
you know, material and yeah, I, I don't know. I've, I, you know, I've seen some say that the movie is kind of immature like that, that, you know, Shane Black in, in the first time he's able to direct is kind of like, it's, is uh, it's like a child who, you know, who got their hand on, on something that's just for adults while his parents weren't looking or something. It's not that he really, it's not in the aspect when, when it comes to the more some somewhat tasteless material, it's not that he's really like getting, you know, accomplishing something so much as him like flaunting that he got this past the, the people who should have stopped him. And yeah, I mean, tone wise, it can be very darkly comical, but at points also very optimistic. And it's definitely more unique than generic. I haven't watched very many movies that are very similar to this. And actually, considering that this came, you know, the, I think this came, I'm going to say 29, I know when this movie came out, 2005, I'm trying to figure out, I think it was 1976 that the movie, I'm almost certain it's called Murder by Death and not Death by Murder, because Death by Murder would be what you expect, and the point is that it's not what you expect. But, yeah, that's what I'm going to keep referring to it as Murder by Death. And so, so obviously, you know, Shane Black can't just do that movie, you know, and I would say he does a really great job of not just doing that movie. I mean, really, this is more of a... I think you would compare this more to like a Sam Spade kind of thing, where Murder by Death is closer to like a... Like an, like an Agatha Christie kind of thing, you know, a Hercule Poirot, or, uh, I forget the, the name of the, the elderly woman who's a detective, but yeah, you know, one of those, you know, as a, yeah, this is not really a spoiler, that movie is about well, there's more than one detective, but detectives who are in a place where there are a lot of people and suddenly there's a murder. And as such, it's now up to, you know, in, in the case of this movie, that murder by death, the detectives, not just the one detective, to determine who did it. And you know, from there on out, it just, it goes, it does a bunch of things that you didn't see coming. This is more the, the, yeah, you know, the, if this movie had been made when he was still alive, Bogey might have played the role, you know, yeah, I, did he ever do a role where he kind of made fun of other roles? And, and, you know, it's, it's the, the, Not that Harry is completely like him, but there is this this sort of cynic kind of you know trying to figure out and and weighing everything. He's he it takes a lot to to really like surprise him or impress him. Some of the time, other times it's not as much. But you know, or at least that's the that's how he tries to carry himself. He would like for others to think that it takes a lot to really shock him, you know, and yeah, it is this more kind of, yeah, noir, you know, and yeah, you know, I love both of these kinds of murder mysteries, but Murder by Death was, was the Agatha Christie kind of thing, and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is the, the bogey Sam Spade kind of thing. And, yeah, so I would say by far the best element of the movie, it's a, it's a close tie between the sense of humor and the storytelling. 
And I would say if you enjoy the kind of humor, you know, I... Shane Black has a very distinct sense of humor. So, you know, if you watched Last Boy Scout or The Last Kiss Goodnight or Iron Man 3 or The Predator and you're like, I want more of that, this has more of that. And the storytelling, th this, this thing of, you know, not only having narration, but having the narrator, like, literally suddenly realize, oh, crap, I, I forgot to tell you this thing that you, okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to pause the movie here and just show you this other thing because it's kind of important. And you'll know why once you've seen it. And it's just, and it, the fact that the movie doesn't lose you, you know, you would think that that, and, and that's kind of the joke, you know, the, the movie is basically saying, you know, it's, it's constantly drawing attention to itself and to its storytelling, which is where, you know, some critics, excuse me, felt that that was completely, that, that the movie is basically in love with itself, and I can see what they mean, but... I love it too, so, but I can understand people who find it, yeah. Yeah, the, the worst aspect of the movie is, you know, some people will find it to be tasteless and crude, and it can get nasty, and I saw some pointing out that basically Shane Black is kind of biting the hand that feeds him. It, it feels like he kind of hates his own work where he lives, the people he knows, feeling that it's also fake and superficial. And that's just, I don't think it overwhelms the movie. But I think for the people who, for whom it does overwhelm the movie, I would say probably what they feel is it's just not particularly pleasant to be in the company of someone who's constantly, you know, if the movie was a person, you would avoid them at a party. You know, they would they would be the, you know, the the really obnoxious drunk guy who's constantly drawing attention to himself, who wants other people to know how much he hates his job, kind of thing. You know, where it's just like, just I'm sorry. You know, maybe maybe go home, sleep it off, get some therapy, but it's you're not fun to be around, basically. I'm not saying I feel that, but I feel like that's probably how the movie feels like to people who do find it. Let's see. And and I do try to I would I will say it sometimes gets close to being excessive in, you know, tasteless. Now, I recommend this movie to any fan of Shane Black, Robert Downey Jr., and Michelle Monaghan. I possibly also Val Kilmer, but it feels like, I feel like he's, is this maybe kind of an unusual role for him? Like, I feel like this is more the other, I love him in this movie, I do, but he is definitely, I don't know, I mean... I also love him in stuff like Heat. <laughs> Trying desperately to think of any other movie that... I don't think I've seen very many of his movies, really. I'm not going to comment on how he is in Batman Forever, because that wasn't his fault. I don't think anybody's performance in that movie is the fault of anyone, but... The late, what's his name again? Joe Schumacher. I don't hate that man. I didn't when he was alive either. This is not like a don't speak ill of the dead thing. I think some of his movies legitimately really worked. But I don't think he was the right person to direct Batman. On a scale of... 1 to 10, I give this movie 10 bad grammar lessons out of 10. Let's see. Yeah. 
brings us to the disclaimer section. And once again, from here on out, there are spoilers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during disclaimers since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So, yeah, from here on out, you know, the, the video contains spoilers. I don't intend to spoil anything other than this specific movie, but if I, you know, so, so if I bring something up, I'm not going to spoil it without warning. If I get to something where I just want to spoil something, I'm going to tell you before I spoil, and then I'm going to hold up an index finger for as long as I'm spoiling so that you can mute and skip ahead. And then when you see me lower my index finger, that's your cue to unmute. And let's see. So, yeah, content warning and or trigger warning. What can I say? I have a hard time understanding the distinction, but I do really respect how necessary the terms are. I want to cover my basis. I am going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of this movie, including rape, pedophilia, incest, desecration of a corpse, and I might discuss the gay stereotypes. I'm not 100% sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, and I guess... What would that go under? I guess mutilation, the, the finger that comes off. I don't have a problem with violence more in general, but things wrong with favorite horror movies and movies in general. Also love Cronenberg's The Fly, video drone, etc. I don't have a problem with film sexuality and nudity, disturbing the setting material in general. Monster is one of my favorite movies. Let's see. Yeah. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here, I loved every line they put in the IMDb memorable quote section. So you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. So, let's see. The rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of this analysis, some of this MST3K riff tracks and other jokes. Now, the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. And the, you know, the section... After this one is thoughts that I have while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. The second section is thoughts that I had before watching. And in the final section, I get into stuff I think is worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, MDB, and Wikipedia. And I think that more or less covers this section. Let's see, does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters, and do I think they made the right choice on that? I guess it doesn't really, it, it doesn't really have a lot of empathy for Harlan Dexter, I want to say was his name, or the people working for him. And I think that was the right choice. You know, like, you understand why they did it. You know, he was afraid he'd lose millions. And the, you know, the goons are probably getting paid good money. So, you know, and, and that is, you know, yeah. A lot of noir, it's like, it's about the money. Now. Right, and the first time I watched this was in the year 2013. Uh, you know, when Shane Black made Iron Man 3. Because 
I knew that this movie existed. You know, Lindsay Ellis put it on her, what was it, the top 10 favorite movies this week. It's been a while since I watched that video because it's currently, you know, she made that when she was the nostalgia chick and she has recently decided to make those videos private. But yeah, she talked about it and she, you know, one of her favorite movies, at least at the time, I don't know about still. And I was like, it sounds good, but I you know I'm not going to watch every single movie that I could spend the rest of my life doing nothing but watching movies that sound good to me. I have to be a little more selective. But when I heard, you know, when I heard that he was going that, to, that Shane Black was going to do Iron Man, I was like, oh, that's amazing. That's awesome. I can't wait to see it. I was a tiny bit worried that he would go a little too, you know, once I watched this movie, I was a little worried that he was going to go too deep into that. But I think he found an incredible balance between the Hollywood blockbuster and the the kiss kiss bang bang approach, you know, and but but yeah, I I feel like the you know, I'm I'm really glad that he got to make Iron Man three and despite the Predator not being that amazing of a movie, I'm glad that he got to do that. I and he's like I think he's still on for doing I forget what it was called, but I think he's doing at least one more comic book adaptation. And I can, yeah, I could definitely see that. I think he did an incredible job with, with the comic book excuse me, material in Iron Man 3. Not all of it was exactly what we expected, and I get why some people were frustrated. Again, not spoiling anything, but I do think that Overall, he did an incredible job. And I think that does... Yeah, you know, the, the moment that I heard that he was going to direct Iron Man 3, I was like, well, then I got to see what else he's... You know, I knew that he'd only directed one other movie. If, if I thought he directed 10, I might have been like, okay, I'm not going to watch all of them, but yeah. And that brings us to the next section, which is called Notes Taken While Watching. Such an unbelievably dark opening joke. For maybe five to ten seconds, you do believe that this eight-year-old boy actually did start chainsawing through the, you know, like... I guess the, let's see, if she if he's sawing her in half, it's, it, it's like midsection, I think. You know, that he did start chainsawing through the midsection of this eight-year-old girl. You know, again, I love this movie. I, I feel like with this movie, it's somewhat like with the rules of attraction. The more of the joke, you know, maybe not as much, because this one does have a number of jokes that aren't quite so the harsh as that. But, you know, to an extent... The more of the jokes you laugh at, the further deep down in hell you are going to go. But you know what they say, go to heaven for the climate, hell for the company. What I'm getting at is, I understand people who think that this movie is tasteless. But yeah, that is really, and it's, I did not expect the movie to open with, you know, I, I heard that, you know, oh, detective story and Robert Downey Jr. I did not expect it to open with, you know, the eight-year-old magic show. And, this, and, and it's just like, you know, the kid cuts in and he's like, I, I thought, I thought it would be okay. Like, this is, you know, just horrifying. The, the father comes running and he opens the box and we see, no, 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 he wasn't even close. He didn't even nick her. There is no, you know, she can't possibly have felt pain, but maybe, maybe it's like discomfort from being like, you know, at this odd angle kind of thing, you know, but that's no, you know, and the, the father looks at the girl and she's like, I'm going to be an actress. And he slaps, yeah, that's, but that, you know, and, and for a while you don't realize that, you know, the magician was Harold and the, the girl in the box was Harmony. And yeah, but, you know, she wanted to be an actress at age eight and, you know, now she's 34 and she still wants to be an actress. 
I love how vague the opening narration is. We changed the world. We didn't mean to and it didn't last long. That kind of thing can. You know, like, it, it is this thing of, like, we, we wonder, is this that kind of, like, I'm, I'm not going to give titles because that would be a spoiler, but there are, in fact, noir murder mysteries that where the opening narration is from the detective as he's dying, you know, or are some of them from when he's already dead? I guess possibly some of them, are, yeah, you know, and you, you wonder, like, you know, it didn't last long. It's like, oh, it, did they die? You know, is he dead? Is, uh, or, or is he lying, like, dying, and he's revealing this from having almost died, and then near the, near the end of the movie, he does almost die. He did take a bullet, which is also just such a great, like, you know, oh no, the, the, you know, for a second, it's like, you know, at first it's like, oh no, he, he was, he was hit. And then it's like, ah, oh, the, the book stopped the bullet. Oh no, it totally didn't. And he's still hurt and just, yeah. And, and it even has the, the shot from like the, the, you know, the, the, the pool and the, yeah. Just, yeah. And, let's see. And, yeah, the, the, they're, you know, so we get the, the flashback. Harry and Richie are, like, trying to steal a toy. And, like, it's, it's a nice little bit. Like, they, they knew that you gotta get the, I, I don't remember. I used to know why that's why the thing they did works to dis disable an alarm system but basically like they stuck a wire into the plate twice so that it sends the signal back or something like that and because the the place is so you know it's new york it's close to the subway so when the subway train or wait is that whatever the the train car you know shakes so the, 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 one of the wires pops out and the alarm starts and then they run out and then there's, there's this woman, you know, pointing a gun at them saying, we're going to wait here while I, you know, until the police arrive. And Richie's insisting that the gun is not loaded while pointing it at the woman. He is not the brightest ball, but you know, like in his mind, he doesn't have to put the gun down because it's empty anyway. It's not a th threat. Like, it, it, you know, like hypothetically, if, you know, if she thought that he was, you know, if, if what he was holding that she saw as a gun was like an umbrella or something, he'd be like, I, I don't need to put it, it's not dangerous, you know, it's, you haven't disarmed me, I'm not, I, I was never going to be able to shoot you, you know. I really love that the way Harry gets out of being chased by the cops is that he accidentally goes into an audition they think he's method acting as he's actually grieving like the the th and and at first his his acting is terrible which is also you know perry comments on that later I, this the shit better be improving your acting because he yeah dabney told of course he did you think dabney's not gonna tell you know because at first when he walks in he's like i'm not going to give up anything you know he, he's terrible he's just beyond and it's really it's it's quite amusing seeing such an incredible actor pretend he can't act you know but then the the you know they they keep going through the audition because they, you know, whatever maybe he needs to warm up that's not unheard of some of the best actors needed to warm up a little they weren't they weren't completely you know so so they give him a few more and and the the you know she reads the other part of the script out loud and she she kind of gets into it she's she does a good job which is you know sometimes that's and that can definitely help but you know when she says this you you got you you got him killed you might as well pull the trigger and he's like i got richie killed i can't believe and and he goes through the th you know they think he's ad-libbing. They think that he, oh, well, I mean, that's not in the script, but it's good, you know? And, and they think that he's doing a great performance. And in reality, he's like, he's grieving. He feels terrible. 
and it's yeah they're not even in LA yet but still when the cop busts down the door he realizes it's an audition he's like oh, sorry good luck and he leaves like like he caught like he caught Harry praying or something like like he oh but he he's you know he's in the church he has sanctuary this is this is holy you can't interrupt this it's just you know just such such a good yeah Let's see. and and it really like it it is you know when you first the the you know, for, for one thing, you really don't expect, you know, aspiring actor to have got, like, he was, like, robbing a toy store, you know, I, I guess days, days before he got to the party. You know, you really don't expect that. And then the, so, so when you see that he's, you know, robbing a toy store, you must, you're like, I guess the alarm didn't go, oh, right, yeah, they, they disabled the alarm. And then the alarm does go off, and they're like, "Oh, I guess uh, did they have to? Did they have to shoot that woman to get out?" Nope, she shot Richie, because you know all this stuff, and and you assume that when he, you know, he he gets to this place and he walks up the the stairs, and and goes into a room, you you expect him to be able to hide in there. It's like, nope, he immediately ran into other people. And then the cop does, you know, and then you're like, oh, maybe the cop didn't realize he must have gone in there, so he just went back. Nope, the cop realized, but he's not gonna, you know, it's it's an audition. This is this is holy. This is like, this man just found God. You can't it's just, you know, you you apologize and then you leave. I love that. I love the names of the Johnny Gossamer books. Straighten up and die right. You'll never die in this town again. Was one of them called Die Job and it's like D I E instead of D Y or something like that, where you like the pun is that it's yeah. And Harmony uses Silly Putty to you know get the the I guess the face of Johnny Gossamer from the book, which you know Harry mentioned earlier. Maybe you're wondering how you know how does Silly Putty grab images from comic books, you know. That's why he said it. It was on his mind. He was about to talk about Harmony, you know, using that. And the proto-cop, it's like, it's Robocop, clearly, you know. And this just, like, it's such a, it's so messed up. Like, he's, like, he hasn't worked for two years since proto-cop got cancelled. And there's a rerun of Protocop, so he got really upset. So he put on the robot costume, and he goes to his neighbor's house and starts opening beers and drinking. And you know, she comes out and she's got the bat. And and again, like for a second, you you know, you think, oh, there's gonna be like a fight. No, no, he's like he notices that she's there, and he gets really shocked. So he backs up, and he falls off the balcony, and like just. Wow, that's dark. And, and like, so apparently he died. And so she gets interviewed and she's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I see him around and I know, oh, that's Protocop. I, I watch that show, you know. And then she makes the crack about this town, you know, the, the LA can't stop messing with people. It's like putting a whoopee cushion on the electric chair and it's just, I mean, you're not wrong, but wow, that's a, that's an image. And, you know, once the, you know, the, the, you, you expect Harry to, to win that fight against the, the asshole who's about to rape her. And it's, it's the, like, and and he he comes off as really tough. Like the the stuff he says, you know, the 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 other guy says, "I'm gonna I'm gonna fuck you up." No, you'll try, and that little experiment will. End. Oh crap! Now I'm joking. I'm quoting the movie just like I said I wouldn't. Anyway, he's he's doing the tough guy act, and smash cut from his tough guy act to him being like beaten to a pulp, like bloody and in pain, and and just. 
yeah, really, yeah. And the very first thing, you know, when, when Harry first encounters Perry directly, Perry tries to help him because he got beat up. Which actually, come to think of it, you know, later he says that he's not, it's not that he's being nice to Harry, he's not trying to help Harry. I guess he wanted, yeah, because it made Daphne look bad, that there was a beat up guy lying there bloody. So he wanted him to leave, basically. That's the, yeah. And I do really appreciate that, the... You know, one of our, I, I feel like it's fairly reasonable to call them our three leads. One of our three leads is an asshole. Like, ass fucking hole. Complete asshole. Just the, the, yeah. And he knows it and he admits it. You know, that's also, I really appreciate that there at the end, you know, instead of, like, you know, for a while he works for Dabney, and, I mean, he clearly doesn't even think... It, it, yeah, it's just... It's a job, you know. You, you work in a big city, you work in L.A., you take the job you get. And there at the end, when they have, you know, private detective agent... Or wait, did he... Oh, sorry, he did already have a private detective agency. I don't know, I just... I guess I get the sense that he's no longer working for Daphne there at the end, but I guess it's possible that he still is. It just seems like a good, just, yeah, anyway. And, and, and again, you know, the, the, you have the, you know, Harry walks up to Harmony and starts talking to her. And at first, like, she's, it's not going super great, but he does eventually start to charm her and make, make her smile and such. And, and yeah, for a while, it's like, you know, you know, he's talking about how uh, she reminds me of my high school, you know, the girl in high school that I was in love with. And I'm not going to comment on the thing of using... A person to satisfy a fantasy you have about someone who's not even that person. But anyway, you know, you you kind of like, oh, you know, I I hope that they end up together, kind of thing. And and then at first it's like, oh wow, this is not going. Out. Okay, he should probably just bail. But then it does start to work. And then the friend shows up, and and it's like, ah, oh, now that's now he's gonna have to leave. Oh no, wait, he's still being clever and. Yeah, and then you realize, oh, Harmony does kind of, she's not really, she, you know, you would expect her to say, no, 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 it's, you know, what, what was her name? Mar Marleya, I think. Marleya, it's, it's cool, I like him, you know, but no, it's, okay, I guess he's gonna have to leave. Oh, no, wait, he got, you know, he turned for, no, wait, I guess he's gonna leave. Oh, she knows him, and that was actually... She was the, the girl that he knew in high school, and all this stuff just constantly, you know, and and then we, you know, the, the, we see it's, oh, it's, it is going well, and then it, it cuts to the morning after, and you've got the, you know, him waking up, and a girl wakes up next to him, and you're like, ah, oh, they, he did end up, nope, that's more Leia, he ended up going with the, the, Excuse me. The friend instead. And when he goes to, to talk to, to Harmony, he actually almost puts the he, he puts his hand like on the door frame, not not to where his thumb is in, but just like you know, so so like I don't know, I just feel like even the first time you watch it, you kind of get a sense that there's some I guess it subtly plants the idea that when he is talking to someone he might put his hand on the on the door frame and it sets up the idea that if he goes to talk to harmony she might slam the door on him, on him. and you know when when the when when perry you know when when harry goes with him on the you know the the surveillance thing 
he, you know, Perry actually, like, you know, at, at first you're like, ah, oh, this is, we're going to get some fun detective action. And then Perry shoots us down, shoots Harry down. It's like, okay, real life, this business is boring, you know, and it's like, oh, okay, I guess we're just, and, and you, you, you have time to get adjusted to the idea that it's literally just, you know, there's going to be a scene here of them sitting and waiting and, and watching, you know, careful to, nope, car goes flying off, splash into the water, and again, like, the, the, you know, at, at first you don't, what, what is going on, why is, okay, there, maybe, maybe there's a, a drive, nope, there's no drive, oh, there's someone in the, in the trunk, okay, we got it, you know, so, oh, thank God, they're, they're going to be able to save the person in the trunk from drop, nope, her neck was broken, and, you know, it's, and, and then you, you barely have the, have the time to, to think, I guess they're going to go to the police, and there's going to be an investigation, nope, Perry accidentally shot her in the head when he shot the lock to get her out of there, and it's like, we understand why that happened, how that happened, but yeah, if you try to talk to a cop and say, well, I, when I shot her in the face, I was trying to save her life, officer, you, you're being ridiculous. You, you have to hear me out on this. I'm the good guy here. I almost saved a life tonight, you know. Why are you cuffing? Just, no, that's not gonna, so it's just such a, and, and it is that thing. There's so many stories where you are like, just go to the police. The police are going to solve, and, and they have to think of these ridiculous contrivances. I guess technically it is kind of a ridiculous contrivance. I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's a more like, I don't know. It just, it works really well. It works really well that that's why they can't go to the police. They have to solve the case on their own because they accidentally shot the person and, and like, I think Perry's right. I think that her neck was broken and she was already dead. But, yeah, if... Uh, hypothetically, if they talk to the police, then the, you know, the actual killers might find out that they talk to the police and they might get, you know, even if it's like, okay, well, as soon as the autopsy is done, they're gonna know, no, 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 the, the neck was broken, before the the before she was shot well maybe by the time that has happened by the time they've been cleared the the guys who actually killed the the woman have been you know alerted to the fact that they went to the cops and yeah and i love the the you know at first, you don't think that gun is going to be used anytime soon. It's just like, Harry has a thing. Like, he's, he, I, I guess it's like a neurotic kind of thing. That, like, he, he can't, he, you know, he, he's in the car and he's, you know, he's got his, he, he opens the glove compartment and he's, like, rooting around there. And Perry's like, stop doing that. And, and he finds the gun. He's like, oh, that's, you know, the gun. And we get the, the jokes about it. And then, like, again, like, two minutes later, he, Perry is firing the gun. And so, you know, Harry gets the, the gun, you know, t takes the gun. Let's see. Yeah, I think, he, yeah, I don't remember exactly how, but, you know, the, the gun ends up in Harry's hand. And he throws it away without Perry seeing. And then Perry afterwards is like, you know, and Harry's like, I, I know the gun means a lot to you, so I was worried that you weren't going to be able to throw it away, but you have to throw it away, and you know, it's like, you know, so, so that we don't have a, the, the gun that was fired, from which was fired the bullet that seems to have killed this young woman, you know, but then Perry points out, when they drag the lake, they're going to find my very personal gun, which is really easy to connect to me, you know, just... So, so stupid. And then later, you know, when in the hotel room, Perry, it, you know, they're, they're on the phone and Perry's like, where's the gun? I threw it in the lake. Not my gun, you idiot. Just, yeah. 
so so funny. And and you know the the let's see the the ah where was I going? Right the yeah they they get back and the. The, yeah, you know, the, the, the police call on Harry's phone, and he's like, oh, that, this might be important for Perry to hear as well. And, you know, it's like, oh, you know, Harmony committed suicide. And again, like, the first time you watch the movie, you're like, oh, no, man, she's, you know, and, and like, obviously you're thinking Harry broke her heart, you know, and she, she was despondent, and so, but the the and and again that's that's the kind of thing that would happen in one of these you know noir murder mysteries there's a sudden death and then that like like you think that the rest of the movie is going to be like that they're going to have to solve you know yeah that we're going to figure out no 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 that wasn't a suicide somebody killed harmony who was it and and how this whole thing you know but yeah and Harry's just distraught, and he like leans up against Perry's car, and and Perry's like, "I'm sorry, I, I gotta go. I, I have to." Go. And he eventually just puts his hand. Okay, so so this is Perry's hand. My head is Harry's head. You know, he, so he so he can drive off without like accidentally like you know, if if Harry's leaning on Perry's car. He might get hurt, like if he's leaning and he suddenly falls when there's nothing for him to rest on. The, yeah, and we see the Gennaro's advert, and now it's kind of sad because we think that Harmony suicided. Let's see. And like Perry, let's see. Yeah, yeah, and then you know Harmony shows up, and it's like no, no, no. It was actually, wait, am I jumping ahead? I think, no, yeah, right, the, it's, it's not terribly long before we realize, no, no, she, that's not, you know, yeah, someone is dead there, but it's actually, it's Harmony's sister. And we, it's again, this thing of like, well, we, we knew she had a sister, but we had no idea she was in LA. And, and the thing, and, and, oh, so the sister came by and she actually stole the, you know, she stole some cash, and she stole the the credit card, and which we're later told, well, that's not in Harmony's name, because, like, you know, if you're gonna, yeah, if you want a job, and you're going around saying, oh, my name is Harmony Faith Lane, it's like, ah, oh, okay, we're, you know, like, like how Schwarzenegger originally went by Arnold Strong until he really made it, you know, but, you know, the, the, actual name she does go by the, the you know that is is on her credit card and so when her sister hired Perry that's the name that is just such a such a clever because obviously if like literally when Perry is talking about the details if he said oh you know there's some woman named Lane we'd be like Lane that's Harmony's last name we were already been told you know so See, but but yeah, you know she she comes up and she's like really drunk and really hyper and really freaked out and talking really fast and it's like Harry, are you a detective? You gotta tell me. It, okay, if you're not a detective, you got, I'm gonna go and you just you know just super talking super fast and really really and and you get it and it's also it's so ta tasteless that Harry's like looking at her breasts and just dude, her sister just died and. And he's also, uh, he's admitting, he's like, okay, I, I shouldn't have, I should have told her that I'm not really, you know, a detective and this whole thing. And, and like, and, and we get the thing, you know, Flicka, you know, my friend Flicka. And, and, and it's true. He did, he told Flicka that he was a detective. You know, he was, he was basically, you know, like how he said to the other, to, to that other one, other young woman, that he invented die as a kid and he's since retired and you know like he's 
he's basically making inside jokes that no one but him and the audience, you know, can can laugh at. And yeah, you know, she's like, I, you know, I need you to work the case to figure out, you know, who killed, who actually killed my sister. And you know, he, you know, eventually agrees. And then, you know, and the audience is like, okay, well, you know, now, now we're gonna get a relaxed scene where nope there's a dead body in the you know yeah and like perry points out it's ridiculous that the body is there but it does make sense once we're told you know the killers were at dexter's party and they recognized harry from you know when when he yelled at them after the car crashed and the, yeah but but it's such a clever like you know oh the 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 body is there so they're dialing 911 to give uh, an anonymous tip, which again, like that's that's a really excuse me, that's a that's a bad situation for Harry to be in, and and then you have the thing about the the accidentally peeing on the corpse, which is really tasteless and so unbelievably so so funny, and and the. <laughs> And Harry tries to, you know, he, he tries to ask Perry. So I, I peed on the corpse. Can they like get DNA off, the, you know? And and Perry interrupts and look. Okay, I get to ask the question here because my question is very important here. Why? Just yeah. And and the. I I I could watch scenes, of Val Kilmer's Perry like without just the exasperated at Robert Downey Jr.'s Harry over the phone when when Harry's talking about evidence like I if there were 10 scenes in the movie of that instead of two it, you know it would still not be too much for me I I love it so much when when he's asking about the the P and DNA and I think you know I, I heard there actually is not any DNA in, in P, which, you know, like there's a lot of bodily fluids that has DNA, but apparently urine isn't one of them. Which means, Harry, you're in luck. That was terrible. And, yeah, the other time it's with the, you know, um, fingerprint, because cause the dog, and, and, and Perry thinks, Look, Harry, I don't care if you like touch the dog with your hand. They're not gonna they're not gonna find your finger, you know, and, and Harry's like trying to say, no, like the dog ate my home my uh, not my homework, but my my finger. You know, it, it has it in its mouth, which means that if it drops it and then it like swallows and it's like We're good. I guess we're good, you know, and, and yeah, the whole thing just and harmony you know, leaving Harry's place over here so that the cops are headed up to Harry and realize that he's been set up. So she sends them to 514 instead of 714. And she does call to warn, but he doesn't answer. Yeah. And, you know, they're like, oh, this is gonna, it's gonna be such a problem to get this corpse out of this. But how are we gonna, if we're caught on the stairwell with a corpse, and the audience is like, how are they going to get out of this? And then we see the roof access. And it's like, phew, they're going to they're gonna throw it off the roof and that's going to be that. And we see it and it's like the body perfectly hits like the, like just barely almost drops in. I love that. Like they don't, it doesn't hit like the side of it. No, no, it almost drops in, but then it doesn't. And it's at the same time. It's still like the laws of physics are in effect here. It's not that it like. It should have fallen, but then it didn't somehow. No, no, no. It like they if they had thrown it just a tiny bit further, it would have dropped in, and that would have been that. But it just barely hits and then falls down, and then they have to go down and put the just <laughs> because the cops are right there. You know, if the if the cops find the body and they were told, you know, and then they go in and ask what which room was it? Wh wh who lives in that? Actually, yeah, they've already been told. The person who lives in that room, his name is Harry Lockhart. So if they find the body, 
and they already know that they're looking for Harry Lockhart, you know, that's, they, they have to, and, and just, yeah. I love that Perry doesn't agree to help Harry pretend that he's a detective, and then Harry tries to get her to help, like, fill in the phony story, like, and again, like, we've seen this a thousand times, you know, one of the, it's, you know, you've got the buddy comedy, and yeah, they don't like each other, but, uh, you know, one of them will start this bullshit story, and it's like, you're not gonna, no one's gonna believe that, and then the other person will like, yeah, that's true, in fact, this, this, and this ridiculous detail, and then the other person like, oh, okay, I mean, it, they both, they seem to agree, and their stories match up, or whatever, you know. But no, Perry's like, I, you know, I, I guess I don't want to repeat it, because I'm not 100% certain that the, the gesture he does is not like an obscene gesture, but it's like, it's just, Perry, throw him a bone here, just add a little bullshit to his bullshit, and that'll be that, but no, he's just, he's so unwilling, like, he, that's one of the things that I really love about this movie. For a lot of it, Perry really can't stand Harry. Like, Harry is like this, uh, like, th this, this annoying little dog that's following Perry around and preventing him from getting the things done that he would normally, like, Harry makes so many things so much worse for Perry. And it's just... So, so Perry's not gonna throw him a bone. He's he's just gonna, yeah. Let's see. And yeah, and Perry calls Harry, and we realize that the murder was, you know, the the murdered woman was Dexter's daughter, and. And, and the, you know, Perry tells Harry he's being used, the, the whole thing with Colin Farrell, he's just there to protect Debney. And then he's like, you know, I would understand if you wanted to take a swing at me. And then Harry does, and he lands, and it's just, that's really funny. Like, and and when, when he hits him, Perry's like, you know, he doesn't verbally say, but he's basically communicating it's a figure of speech. I wasn't saying go ahead and punch me in the face. You stupid fuck. What is wrong with you? You know, just and and like and and for a second it's like, oh, there's gonna be a fight. No, no. Cause Perry could basically if Perry wants to, he could run circles around Harry. So Harry should count his lucky fucking stars that Perry does not want to fuck him up like the, the guy at the party did, you know. And really, at the end of the day, I guess the reason he doesn't is because that would look bad for Dabney. Then people were like, Dabney, what the fuck? You're the, the guy, you know, the, the consultant working for you. I saw him beat the crap out of this guy. You know, and, and that might go, yeah, that's probably why. Let's see. And then, you know, Harry realizes about the, the name because... You know, he's about to leave for New York, and he runs into to Flicka, and she she was telling the truth. She's uh, she's a stewardess, so she's at the airport, and they happen to run into... There's a joke in Civil War where Robert Downey Jr. says to another character, Isn't it weird how you run into people at the airport? Was that a thing on... Actually, yeah, I guess it's actually, it's probably just a thing on... Movies in general, characters always run into people at the airport that are useful for, for them to run into. That's probably it, yeah. It's not... Excuse me. Anyway, so, yeah, like, the, the you know, they, they you know, and, and he and Flicka briefly talk, and he pieces together, wait, Ames, that was the name, that, that's the person who hired Perry. You know, so this whole thing, and, and, I love that he, he, re, you know, he basically thinks out loud and says, her, you know, what, what's it called, her, her professional name is written on her, 
credit card and you know he's thinking about and Flick is like how should I know if <laughs> and you know Harry calls Perry to tell you know that the case is the same case and he includes this dig at Perry being overpriced you know two grand for for this you know surveillance case and just it's it's such a you know you overpriced bastard I love how ridiculous the party that you know it's let's see that it's the thing of the, the per, sorry Harry is going to the party because Perry believes that the people who were at the, the two keep two people who killed the woman were at the first party well you know so so they communicate that to to harmony and harmony says well there's this other party where all the same people will be so you know harry go there and you'll you know maybe you'll be able to find them and he goes to the party and just these pre pretentious art pieces just you know, one one of them looks like a, I want to say a reindeer, and like it's just, and and Harry's staring at them, and his reaction is our reaction is like, what the what the fuck is, who would who does this appeal to? What is what is just yeah. Harry has a surveillance job at MacArthur Park. I don't know. I hear that place is frightening after dark. And, and the two goons, you know, will argue over references and nicknames. I really love it. It's just, here we are. Ike, Mike, and, and, and Harry's like, what? And, and the other guy's like, come on, that's, that's pretty, that's, that's way too obscure of a reference. And, and they get into an argument like, you're here to, you're here to intimidate him, remember? You're not being very intimidating right now. Slightly confusing, maybe, but not intimidating. And Harry even thinks, can I... Can I get away without them stopping? And, and for a second, you, the audience, like... Can he? Because they're, like, they're focusing way more on each other and just this this whole... So, so yeah, there's, there's Ike Mike and... Ike, Mike, and Harry? I, f I forget. And you've got the, the fire and the there, and the mustard. So, so yeah, three different versions of, like, I guess the, yeah, no, the first one must be a, rap, a nickname thing as well, I think. But, but yeah, just the, the whole thing. And, and just, they cannot agree on what they're, what they're going to call themselves and each other. And it's this thing of like, like you you expect you know the the moment you see them you you get the you you pretty quickly figure out before Harry probably before Harry does these are the these are the guys these are the the two that you know and it's you know in Harry's defense he's he's like you know he's he's on I want to say Demerol so he's he's a little woozy and you know but. <laughs> I love when when he's like, you know, I'm just I'm gonna like, what was it? Some something about a kettle, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stick my hat up to see if they shoot at it, and then Harmony's like, why don't you put the kettle in the hat, and then they if they shoot it'll ricochet. It's just wow. But the the yeah, you know you have the ah, what's it called? Actually, yeah, let me just very briefly say, I think she she does a really great job at making a strong impression. She comes across as really intelligent and, like, driven as, like, you know, you know, maybe at first you're like, oh, well, she's, she's an L.A. girl. If you're like Harry, you think, you know, they're all so shallow. They have nothing, you know, there's, there's nothing, you know, they, they don't have any deep thoughts and such. But you realize she she does. Excuse me. She's she's very intelligent, very, very driven. She spends most of her screen time in these 
you know, at, at one point, Harry even has to take off her hat because I, just, I, I can't take you seriously while you're wearing this thing. You know, she spent so much of her screen time, you know, looking like a, just, you know, she's, they have her wearing these, you know, the, the, the people that she's working for have her wearing these ridiculous outfits to, to appeal to the people at the parties and such. But yeah, we, we take her seriously. I mean, that's also like, it's, it's legitimately funny seeing her run around with like a revolver and she's wearing this, like, she looks like she, you know, she, she looks like she has started working for Santa purely to get access to the naughty list so that she can scratch her own name off it, you know, and, and just, yeah. And, you know, she's struggling with this guy who looks much tougher than her, and yet she wins pretty quickly, and it's the, you know, and he doesn't think about, well, you know, there's no, if he has both of his hands on her throat, there is nothing that it, you know, he, it, there's not much he can do to prevent her from kneeing him in the groin, and yeah. Let's see. And... Let's see, what is that? Did I not? I love all the, the chaos in MacArthur Park once the... Yeah. There's just, there, there are so many unexpected, you know, at, at first it's like, you know, they, they ripped, the, the two goons ripped open Harry's stitches. And so, you know, he's going to have to go back to the hospital and get it restitched. And Harmony is like, yeah, I'm taking it to the hospital. They're right there, though. I mean, we're not going to be able to catch them there might not be another, you know, now that they, it, there's a chance that those two are not going to show up at the next party. We might not get another chance to, to catch them. And so she's going to have to to drive, and, and she sees that they get out of their car, so she's going to get out of her car. And she grabs the, and, and she's, I got the gun that you gave me. What? <laughs> He's like, you know, he, he doesn't have anything in his mouth, but he practically does a spit, spit take. You know, it's like. How did let's see the gun? So you know, it's not Perry's gun. Was that the gun that he was supposed to throw out because it has his fingerprints, or it might have his fingerprints? But you know, the the gun that was there to, and she somehow thought that that was a gun that. He wanted her to use. Yeah, I'm. I'm not one harm. That I'll freely admit. At this exact moment, I can't completely recall how that. But you know the the. Let's see. Yeah. So. She you know she she parks and she goes after the guy and it's like you you can understand why but it's still. I mean, if Harry, he, he's really going to need that finger to, you know, and he straight up passes out from the pain. You know, that's, that's a thing the human body does. If, if just, if you're experiencing a, a very significant amount of pain in a very short space of time, and, there, and, and your brain doesn't really think that it's going to stop in just a minute or so, yeah, you're going to pass out because, you know, and, and, extreme amount of pain can really do some some damage to to you know so you know he passes out and and so she okay i'm gonna try not to just it'll it'll be kind of boring it'll be it'll make for not particularly enjoyable watching for you the viewer i appreciate your your watching i'm gonna try to make this entertaining for you and not just restate every single thing that that happens at macarthur park after dark it hits the mark so the yeah you know she goes off running and and you you and harry the you know the audience and harry like were like what got what is she talking i didn't get i didn't mean for you to 
grab a gun and go and shoot, you know, and the, the, yeah, for, for a little while, it looks like she's going to be able to catch up to them, and then the, the, I think it's the, the black guy, you know, he shows up and grabs her, and again, like, for, for a few seconds there, you think he's going to be able to, to, like, maybe not kill her completely, but he's going to, like, uh, what's it called, it's, uh, choke her out, you know, so that she passes out, and then instead she needs him in the groin, and I don't know, do, do we really think that she's going to be able to shoot him? I guess we, we, we don't expect her to, really, but, you know, she, she goes off running, and she, you know, she's trying to catch up to Perry, and, and, you know, we think that it's gonna be one of those where she's like, Perry, and he turns around, and he realizes, and maybe he grabs the gun and quickly shoots the, the guy in the car, you know, but no, she doesn't, you know, and, and we expect, well, at least she'll, she'll just, you know, stop short of where she could get, it. but no, she goes over, and, and then the, and, and then we're like, that's it then, I mean, Perry's not gonna hear it, he's gonna die, but nope, she drops the gun, and, you know, it's, it hits the ground, fires, and he, the, the bullet hits, I forget exactly what it hits, but it, you know, something near Perry, and he hears that, and he immediately goes into survival mode, so he grabs the gun, and again, we're like, oh, this is gonna be the badass thing where he shoots the bag, nope, it's the, what was it, fish seller or something, you know, he's, he's like selling food, and, you know, he shoots the, the guy, and then the pink-haired girl runs off and gets the, the, ah, what's it called? You know, and, and she, like, she just, she needs to get out of there. She's, she is freaked out. So she, she sees a car, and it's got the keys in it. Oh, you know, I'm not going to question this kind of luck. So she drives off, and she doesn't look in the back, and Harry doesn't make any sound because he's passed out, you know, and just, and so he wakes up, and he's like, I, okay, so I, I'm sorry, I kind of need some help with this thing, and, you know, he, he hears the, you know, yeah, he, he hides under the, 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 the thing, the bed, I want to say, and, you know, for, like, yeah, and, and we, you know, we hear, we the audience basically realize, well, that's got to be the pink-haired girl we're hearing, because she was driving, you know, and we maybe, well, maybe even recognize the guy's voice, well, that's, yeah, because, right, because Harmony didn't shoot him, and so, yeah, maybe she called him and told, you know, so this is, you know, I'm, I'm going to need your help, I'm, this is where I'm at, you know, and, and we think that, you know, there's going to, it's, we, we certainly don't think that he's going to shoot her, but that's, you know, he said, you know, Mr. Dexter said, you're never going to go through this again. I promise. And then he shoots her. And then you have the thing of, like, there are countless movies where someone is shot and drops to the floor. But this is one of the ones where when they drop to the floor, there's someone right in front of them. And he's like, oh, if she yells out, the guy's going to shoot me. So he's like, and, and he tries to put his finger on her lips, and, and she's lying there dying. And I, I know some people don't like when someone is shot in a movie and they don't immediately die. I think the idea is supposed to be that he shot her in one or more major organs. Did he shoot her more than once? I think he shot her more than once. He shot her in the major organs. If he shot her in the heart, she's dead immediately. If he shot her in the head, dead immediately. But if he shoots one or two of the major organs... Yeah, she might live, you know, she, from him shooting her until she's all dead, I think it's maybe 30 seconds. Yeah, if if the if he hit a major organ, that's that's a realistic amount of time for her to still be alive. Excuse me. And yeah, you know, he's trying to to shush her and then he you know, crawls out from under there and we see the gun is still on the on the bed and I know, you know, obviously we're thinking how could he leave the gun? He didn't think anybody else was in the house. There, there, there is no reason for him to think that Harry would be in there. There's literally no reason. And he has his hands full. It's not like he was just randomly put... No, he put the gun down so he could go and... He was gonna, like, take care of her body, you know, clean... 
hide the body and and clean up after where he you know and so you know harry grabs the gun and again you you you're like is he really going to be okay with shooting you know is he going to be ready for and then it it is the the it it is this thing of like the the goons start talking and we're like is he going to be able to talk harry out and nope he just shoots him I love Harry trying desperately to get the finger back from the dog, like, and it is the thing, like, if you ever encountered a dog, if it, if it grabs something and it wants it to itself, it might not, you know, and it's not like he's the dog's owner even, so it's like, yeah, you know, and he's, he keeps trying to get and, and convince, the, come, come on, come here, and, and the whole thing, and just, yeah, and, and then, like, He's, you know, he's on the phone with Perry, and he's talking about, you know, I, I'm afraid that my finger will be left at the crime scene. They'll, they'll, you know, fingerprint, and they'll know I was here, which might make them think that I killed the pink-haired girl. And actually, him killing the, the, you know, the black guy, that was, if they, if they can't prove that that guy was dangerous, then that is a bit, you know... I mean, it wasn't even self-defense. It was revenge, but not self-defense because the, the other guy didn't have a, a gun. But yeah, you know, so... And then suddenly... The, and, and the dog has it in its mouth, which, again, like, it's convenient for the writing, yeah. But sometimes a dog will carry something around in its mouth without eating... You know, without trying to swallow it immediately. But then, you know, it swallows and, and Harry's like, we're okay, we're okay. The, the matter has been settled. And then... You know, the you know hang, hangs up. Uh, you know, I, I forget if he's the one who hangs up or Perry is, but you know, then he starts crying at the emotion of having shot the guy, and now the dog comes up to him. You know, basically like trying to comfort him. <laughs> and again, with you know, I understand why some people feel like it's it's tasteless. That's a lot of people being confronted with death in a short space of time who haven't seen death of like. The pink-haired girl, the, the white goon shot by the guys on food in the park. Harry sees the pink-haired girl shot, and then he shoots the black goon. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, Harry brings up the dead woman wasn't wearing underwear. Again, maybe a tad on the taste aside, that the fact that she wasn't wearing underwear is not just brought up once as a throwaway thing. It's actually an important plot point. Like... In order to solve the mystery, you have to keep in mind that when they found a dead girl, she was not wearing underwear. That's that's a bit, yeah. But it's still pretty funny. And Harmony left such a vague message on Perry's machine that they're like, uh, uh, what did you say you were? And Harry's like, I didn't, I didn't say anything to her. And and then you know he says, well, I mean, I told her that the body wasn't wearing underwear. And then you know, and and the the car just stops and and you know, like turns and drives off quick. And and you know, he says the thing about, excuse me, he says the thing about you know, oh, you know, he has a conniption fit over the the underwear thing. And, you know, they, they go to the, the in institution, and I'm sorry, but she's a little funny. The, the you know, the, the patient who's like, she says something about she, she doesn't like Kurt Cobain because he keeps stealing her something something. And, you know, they, they so yeah, they're, they're working the case, and they get into the parking lot, and then they, they spot an orderly. And Perry tries to pretend that he and Harry are just lost. And then the guy says, Mr. Funshrike, you know, he, he knows exactly who he is. So that's, yeah. And it is pretty funny how Perry will say something and then Harry's the one who gets hurt. You know, first it's the, the orderly in the parking lot and then later it's the guy shocking his testicles and the, you know. And, and you know, after Harry gets hit, and he's like, he's the one who said, you know, then when they turn the tables, 
he he s smacks the guy in the ear and he says, "Doesn't that suck? I just hurt you for no reason. I don't even know why I hit you." No, it's still done. And the the. And Perry says, you know, I want you to picture a bullet inside your head. Can you do that? And then he lists all the, the you know, the, the evidence they have. And then the guy's like, I don't know, that's that's kind of ambiguous. And Perry's like, no, nah, I think it's pretty concise. It's, it's, this is very strong evidence. And then Harry's like, I think he's talking about the, the bullet. Like, do you mean imagine in your head that there is a bullet or imagine that in your head there will be a bullet you know what what exactly do you mean <laughs> and i love the the failed russian roulette the the whole thing is just so funny with just you know you you have the let's see the, the yeah they argue over you know harry wants to ask a question and then perry says if you ask questions it makes it seem like we don't know anything. And and then the, you know, Harry wants to do the Russian roulette. So he, you know, bullet in the chamber and spins it. Where is the girl? And he, you know, shoots. And and both of them are like shocked that, that it happened. And and Harry's like, I how could that happen? I only put one, and, and Perry's like, you put a live round? <laughs> and And Harry's like, but that there's only an 8% 8% who taught you math and then he calls harmony and and like you know he's trying to have a conversation with her and harry's standing there and like okay so there's and then, you know and and perry has to tell you stop multiplying ever since 2013 i have been hoping that I would get a chance to use that in real life. That someone would be multiplying in a situation where... So, yeah. It's it's such a great line. And... Yeah. And, and the, the other guy... You know. They, they shoot the guy. And then it's like, okay, well... Again, you know. You expect this is going to be the scene where the bad guy gives up the information. That's that's how this works. But nope. the, the <laughs> He accidentally shoots the guy. Which, is, which never happens when the good guy is play Russian roulette with the bad guys, you know, and so the, the, yeah, you have the, ah, what's it called? You have the, the thing, yeah, you know, then, then it's like, okay, well, he's dead, so I guess we're going, you know, we, we gotta, and, and then they get caught, and then you have the, Yeah, the, the, you know, Harmony calls Perry's phone again. And the, the, let's see. Yeah, the, the you know, obviously Harlan Dexter wants that. I will never tire of watching, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, but uh, the guy who plays Harlan Dexter in this, and he was on L.A. Law, and yeah. I love him playing sinister and intimidating. He's 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 so good at it. But yeah, you know, he he wants the phone, and so the guy, you know, grabs the phone from Perry, throws it, and then Harry reaches, you know, catches in midair, quickly asks for help. But then, you know, since he suddenly stops talking on the phone, Harmony realizes he must be in trouble, so she pretends to be a carpet cleaning company. If she had hung up, they would know that she was coming, you know, so it's just, it, yeah, she, she's really intelligent, and she saves the day. I, she probably does more things that intentionally save the day than Harry does, I think, but, but yeah, let's see, you know, with Harry, it tends to be because Perry is helping him that he doesn't completely screw up as much as, excuse me, but yeah, the, the, and and it's so great because again, like for a second, you wonder, you know, is is the bad guy right? Was it just a carpet cleaning company? Because again, that's like 
let's see, is that a thing that happens in the movies? That, like, a... I, I, I'm not 100% certain if, if that would be, like, a cliche that we're now, like, doing cliche dodge, or if you expect it to be someone that the character knows, and the idea of it being carpet cleaning is, is the cliche subversion. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Anyway... But, but yeah, you know, and then it cuts, and we see that it's her, and she's got that great, like, knowing look on her face that she knows, you know, as, as she's firing off this, you know, pretending to be this carpet cleaning company, yeah, that, that she's, you know, she's tricking them, and I love, like, you have this shot of, like, you know, you've got, you've got the van in the shot, and you've got the, the couple of goons standing behind it, and she doesn't get like a close up or something. She just sneaks in. She runs into shot just in at the edge of the shot and runs into the the you know in, into the front of the van. And they're saying like, yeah, "Who's gonna drive? Tell you what, I'll flip you for it." And then she just drives off. That's just so great. And she you know because <laughs> that's the coffin. If the bad guys, if she doesn't stop them, the bad guys are going to cremate. The, the the yeah and the and it's also you know and the, the yeah harmony knows to go there because perry told her that the uh, yeah earlier when when he called and he even said call me again as as soon as you know in in a minute or something yeah and yeah you know if if the bad guys managed to to get the the coffin get the body cremated then you know they're they're screwed but when the ah, what's it called and and you also have the thing you know i i feel like there i I've, I've seen murder mysteries where it's like well why did they why did the murder happen just then like there's a i mean it's convenient for the story because then the the characters were in place to find the clues and such but here no you know they had to, the, the boyfriend was coming back from Paris, you know, I, I forget exactly the time frame, but if I understand it correctly, basically, she was in Paris, and she came back maybe, let's go with two weeks, I'm not 100% sure that's exactly, but maybe two weeks, she comes back, and when she's like, she, uh, let me think, at the, yeah, so at the airport, the, the, you know, he comes, Harlan or someone working for him picks her up, and then after she goes back to, you know, like, she, she's at his place so they can talk or something, and he has someone knock her out and put her in the mental facility, which he has complete control over, clearly. We see several people working there completely willing to just, you know, do whatever they're told by him. And, yeah, so, you know, let's see. So, so yeah. And once he does that, he hires the, the pink-haired girl, the young actress, to pose as the daughter. And then they have a public, you know, they, they reconcile their differences. And, you know, and, and that lasts for you know, maybe a week or something, which means that she apparently drops the, the case, the, suing him for millions. And then the, uh, what's it called? Yeah, so, so the, then the, the boyfriend from Paris calls, and he's going to show up, he's going to go to LA to be with her again. And realizing, you know, and, and that means that, you know, he'll obviously know that the pink-haired girl is not the actual, you know, where most of the people in L.A. haven't seen her for 10 years, so, you know, how are they going to know the difference? They, they don't know it closely enough what she looks like, but the boyfriend from Paris will. So Harland has the, the bad guys, you know, kill her and, you know, put the body in the, in the, back of the the car send the car flying and the you know the car is gonna gonna sink 
and it's going to be a while before they find her at all. And Harlan's just going to, you know, when the boyfriend shows up, Harlan's going to be like, I'm so glad you're here. I don't know where she is. She, she left a few days ago and I haven't heard from her since and no one has seen her. And then, you know, after a while, you know, I mean, depending on how deep the, the, yeah, there's, oh, wait, wait one second. Was the body in the, so I guess he wasn't always going to cremate the body then. If the, yeah, but then eventually, huh. Yeah, I mean, no, I, th I think originally he wasn't going to cremate the body. He wanted it at the bottom of that lake. And then once the, once it was no longer at the bottom of the lake, he, he wanted it cremated once it was clear that Harry and Perry were not going to fall for the, yeah. And, you know, the, the Dexter realized that, excuse me, they might go to the mental institution. So he, you know, he told that black orderly to be on the lookout for Harry and Perry. Now. And I, I really love how the, 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 the bit with the cars, excuse me, they do a really good job, like, choreographing, you know. And, yeah, so the coffin goes flying, and, and like, the, the arm is just sticking out there, which is, again, this, like, I mean, it, it being there, that's, you know, that's what Harry grabs onto. I was going to say if the body's still wet, but I guess it wouldn't be after this many hours. Because it hasn't been underwater for several, for a number of hours by now. No, it, it might have dried off, yeah. Because if you try to hold on to a wet hand, I don't think you're going to be able to hold on like he does. But anyway, you know, part of the reason is so he can grab onto her and, and shoot from there instead of just falling over. But it is also this kind of gross thing of like, this, again, kind of tasteless thing of the body. Anyway, yeah, so the, the, but, but yeah, after that, Perry actually steps in front of Harry when the shooting starts. That's a, yeah, very noble of him. And I like, you know, the fact that blood comes out of his mouth when Harry tries to perform mouth to mouth is a good way to show, you know, instead of like, Basically, they didn't want to just show, like, a close-up of a bloody wound or, like, Harry, like, touching his, his chest and then coming up with, oh, blood, you know. But, yeah, like, you know, mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, it, it basically forces the, the body that you're performing mouth-to-mouth -mouth onto, like, breathe to, like, I would say contract the lungs. And if blood comes out of your mouth when your lungs are contracting, that means that at least one of the organs have been pierced. There's not supposed to be blood coming out when you breathe. That's, yeah. Books. And, and Harmony calls Harry's cell, or Perry's cell, so she can ask Harry to save her. And, like, one of the first lines and one of the last lines in the movie is Harmony saying, you know, the, the Herald save, yeah, I, I don't remember exactly, you know, use your awesome might to save me from this terrible plight. And I, I really, I love, I love the entire bit there with him shooting all the, the people, but I really love, like, Harlan Dexter's reaction, you know, like, Harry manages to grab onto the hand, catch the gun, and shoot. And and Dexter's standing there, like, as he's dying, and he just looks at him, Johnny, fucking magic. <laughs> just, and, and it is, like, it just barely does make sense that Harry manages to shoot all, you know, it's pushing it, but it does just barely make sense. You know, like, the rush of adrenaline helps him focus just enough to shoot them. I mean, it's not like he makes some miracle shot. He, let's see, does he shoot, I guess, two or three men, right? 
because he shoots it's, it's something like that you know he yeah he you know he goes flying through the air so his hand is of course going to try to grab something and to and and hold on with those and you know he grabs the gun and you know it's it's a it's a handgun you you aim it directly and then you pull the trigger it's not you know it's not rocket surgery and the the people he shoot he shoots are close enough that a handgun could hit you know i, I mean i'll grant that it's like movie aim but you know it's it's not completely unreasonable and you know one of the guys like he landed on top of the car and the guy shoots up through he doesn't know exactly where harry is is you know lying and he knows like if he sticks his head out to see harry might shoot him direct and so harry you know here's all these shots i forget does he just i think he just points down and shoots at where the shots came from because that's where the guy must be, you know, something like that. I love how ridiculous it is that literally everyone is still alive. Pink-haired girl, the two goons, Abraham Lincoln, Elvis, to really exaggerate the ridiculousness that Perry survived. Which, at the end of the day, I, if the if paramedics got there quickly enough, I think the you know as long as you know, it takes a while before he can walk comfortably again, you know, but yeah, I th it depends on how badly he was hit. And we don't see very long pass without him. Yeah. But yeah, I also love the, the thing that, you know, you think that the book stopped the bullet. You know, and it's like, oh, Harry, you, uh, you want to see something cool? This stop ah oh, it stopped the oh no it it actually my finger can go directly through the hole and you see yep he's he's bleeding too and and that's that is realistic you know a, it has to be a very very thick book if it's just paper for that to stop the bullet you know and I as far as I know it's not particularly unrealistic for so basically the bullet went through Perry through the book and into Harry. Yeah. If it if it went clean through, if it didn't pierce too much, you know, if it didn't mess up too much of Perry's insides, I think just barely they could save his life, yeah. But but just uh, yeah, you know, all of them walk in and they're like smiling, you know, like if if it was real, you would expect the goons to maybe try to kill Harry or something. But no, like they're smiling. Like it's, it's. it's I, I really love just the yeah. And real downer ending that Harmony's sister did commit suicide because she thought she witnessed incest. Very funny mid credit scene, and that was it for this. Oh right, sorry, real quick. Yeah, so without end credits, the movie is an hour, 34 and a half minutes long, and with them, it's 38 and a half minutes long. So that brings us to the next section, which has a name, and I'm going to say it in just a few seconds. So the time matches up. It's called Notes Taken Before Watching. So let's see. I it, it is kind of interesting, you know, Shane Black, since a lot of what he wrote, he didn't get to direct. You know, so Last Action Hero, he wasn't the only writer. But, you know, John McToon, and, and no, it was completely random that... It was, yeah, I last week, I think last week, I did do a review of Last Action Hero, but that was, you know, I originally I wasn't going to review this until a little later, since, you know, 1993, 2005. I have more movies between those two years, but, you know, I realized, hey, I'll do Kiss Kiss Bang Bang for Christmas, you know, but anyway, yeah. Shane Black, you know, wrote Last Action Hero, and John McTiernan directed it. 
and Shane Black wrote Long Kiss Goodnight, and Rennie Harlan directed it, but Shane Black wrote and directed Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, Iron Man 3, and The Predator, so, you know, you can, you can compare the... I, I feel like he... Honestly, all three directors do a good job with the scripts by Shane Black. And let's see... So, yeah, the okay, yeah. So let's see, Val Kilmer. I've seen. He's in Deja Vu. I guess it is it ironic or coincidental that I don't remember. Excuse me, that movie as much as anyway. Alexander. He's Egypt, Ghost in the Darkness. I remember him in The Ghost in the Darkness. I remember a little bit. I like that movie, but it's been a long, long, long time since I watched it the last time. Heat, Batman Forever, Tombstone. True Romance. I love him in True Romance. I am... Okay, so... Yeah, I mean, if you've already watched True Romance, you might already know what he plays in that. And I really, really don't want to give away what he plays for anyone who hasn't. Just, I absolutely love that. And I, yeah. But yeah, so Michelle Monaghan, I've seen her in Source Code. She's in some Mission Impossible stuff. Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I don't think I remember what she plays there, but I have an idea. Constantine? I mean, it says uncredited. I guess she's... Anyway. And the Born Supremacy. Yeah. It's it's really wild. It's the, A couple of the Born movies, it is like, oh, hey, I know who that is. But they've gotten much bigger roles since they were in that. But, you know. Yeah. She's she's one of them, and it, it is like you you immediately recognize her if you know her from other stuff, you know. And yeah, so let's see. The relationship between Harmony and Harry. I mean, he is basically a nice guy. I guess the movie. Is the movie on his side, or does it challenge him? I mean, certainly she's much more intelligent. I really appreciate that they don't end up together. I don't think that would have been... <sighs> yeah, the... the. Excuse me. I, I don't think it would have worked as well. I mean, certainly she does get to, you know, she, he, he makes that speech about how the girls in L.A. are all messed up. And she points out that, you know, and, and they do that thing of, like, she, she yells, who here hates Harry? And everyone raises that, like, most of them can't possibly know who he is. That's, like, obviously not quite happening as such it's basically just yeah anyway the i mean at the end of the day he is the storytelling protagonist he's not the only protagonist but at the end of the day the story is told from his perspective so i feel like the movie is it maybe should at, at the very least i feel like it should challenge him more as um, yeah, I, I feel like at times we're supposed to think harmony is really you know way too her her attitude towards sex, for example. But but yeah, you know the the yeah, it's it's kind of uncomfortable, and I considering some of the other stuff he's written, I don't know if Shane Black 
really realizes the... I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to get too much into it. Excuse me. But yeah, I really appreciate, you know, I'm, I'm not going to spoil, but, you know, you've got, you know, some, some of the stuff in this movie is very, you know, the big sleep, very Chinatown, very double indemnity. When we meet Mr. Fire and Mr. Frank Pan, I can't help but think, come on, c -Note, what would Casey think? And boy, Soap sure got aggressive. I guess he's taking after the Punisher now. I really love how Shane Black writes goons. They're funny in The Last Boy Scout. They're funny in Iron Man 3. Honestly, I hate working here. They are so weird. How did we end up with this shift? And they're funny here. And... Yeah, so... Some YouTube videos. I recommend the Kiss Kiss Bang Bang review by W yeah WTF Christmas Countdown. I recommend yeah Kiss Kiss Bang Bang movie reaction. The bloopers. Renegades cut transphobia in popular media came up when I searched for Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and Renegade cut. He didn't actually mention it, but I enjoyed watching it again anyway, and it's a good video, but I'm not sure. I don't know how relevant you'll find it to this movie. And, let's see. Yeah, the trailers are... The, sorry, trailer is... is it's, it's okay. It, it kind of... Because of the how fast it moves, it kind of takes... You know, some some of the jokes are cut, trimmed down a lot, and it's really unfortunate. And yeah, there's a video called "Frame Rape Kiss Kiss Bang Bang" featuring Shane Black, where yeah, Shane Black says that it was very intentional that Harmony is smarter than Harry, and the ending where Harry Perry, Harry and Perry are in a detective agency together was a reshoot. But yeah, and that was um, actually I had forgotten about this. I think I had heard, but yeah, "Frame Rape" that is. It's what Michael Swain is doing these days, now that Cracked. I mean, Cracked has, has a small, you know, it's, it's, they're starting to do things again, but the original people who worked on it are doing different things now. And yeah, this, that's what Michael Swain is doing. And, and actually, I'm sorry, I just, I have a hard time remembering, I want to say his name was Abe something. I liked him on Cracked, but I'm sorry, it's hard to compete with, you know, people like Swain and the 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 O'Briens, you know, Dan and Crap, I can't rem I can't believe I'm blanking on. But yeah, sorry. The there's at least two O'Briens and one of them's Dan. Jack, I think. Yeah. Dan and Jack O'Brien. You know, obviously as a big fan of, of Crack when it was back, you know, one of you know my two favorites were Michael Swain and, and Dan O'Brien, so, and Soren, Soren's great as well, but I do like Abe. And then there's this, let's see. Hmm. I can't tell what that, was it just called unscript, uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang Unscripted or something like that, it was also a good video. And Hidden Gems of Cinema, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, also a good video, yeah. So, let's see. Right, so the, excuse me, I read and copied in Outlaw Vern's review of the movie, and let's see. Yeah, he apparently, he watched it when, let's see, yeah, uh, Iron Man 1 came out, it looks like, yeah.
Val Kilmer gets to call Robert Downey Jr. an idiot in many different ways. And... I like the way the story pays tribute to noir, but doesn't follow it as stringently as you keep naively thinking it's going to. There are a lot of good laughs that come from seeming to use a normal movie convention, and then actually not. For example, the heroine stumbles onto the clue that solves the whole mystery, so the heroes go chasing after her knowing she's getting herself into danger, but later they learn that she's actually at home because she decided her theory was stupid and forgot about it. And it's true, it's like, you know, you, you hear that she, you know, she's, she's missing, he can't get her on the phone, but she left a message saying that Harry said something, Come to think of it, that's actually why I think there's maybe some chance that Perry wouldn't even have involved Harry at the end, which to be fair could have, you know, that, you know, there, there at the end, Harry is getting put in danger, but yeah, like, Perry calls Harry because the, the, because because Harmony is missing, and she she didn't say on the answering machine what the clue was. She just said that Harry said it. You know, so, yeah. In a way, I think maybe Black's hiatus helped rejuvenate him. It put him back in the just-don't-give-a-fuck mentality of a guy in his early 20s who doesn't know what he's doing. For me, the biggest laugh in the movie involves a bodily mutilation that really has no important purpose in the story, but just as something that could easily happen if people are slamming doors during emotional conversations. He must have been watching some movie with a door-slamming argument and thought, you know what, you know what I'm going to do in the, my next movie? Either that, or he was writing the argument, jokingly thought of doing this, and then realized, why the fuck not? The motto of every great writer, from Mark Twain to the guy who did Choose Your Own Adventure. And let's see. And yeah, I, I gotta, this is, this is such a great, Vern writes, I gotta take my metaphorical hat off, metaphorical hat off to Val Kilmer. And then the next paragraph, he says that Val Kilmer plays a guy who always knows what to do with the drop of a hat, another metaphorical hat, but not necessarily the same one I tipped in the last paragraph. And he brings up the, you know, Val Kilmer's character knows how to fight his way out, even if it involves firing a small gun from inside his underwear. Long story. And that is also great, because Gay Perry is playing so much to this guy's homophobia, so that when the guy sees Perry stick his hand down his pants, he doesn't immediately shoot. You know, normally, if if the, like, if you're pointing a gun at someone and you think they're dangerous and you see them stick their hand in their pants, you're going to shoot thinking that they're grabbing for their gun. But because he's, you know, the, the homophobia is distracting him. Yeah. Yeah, and some of the commenters said that, uh, what's it called, The Nice Guys is a better version of this movie. I haven't watched it. Maybe I will at some point.
but I could imagine, you know, the it's it's one of those things where like the first time you try something, you maybe don't get it perfect, even if you've been practicing for a long time. But I could imagine that the yeah, and I'm not I'm not putting off what you know, I'm not. I'm not saying I'll never watch it. I might watch it. Let's see. I mean, I guess what I'll say is... The reason, you know, I made sure to watch this because the... You know, obviously... I forget when the Nice Guys came out, but I'm almost certain it was after Iron Man 3. I was always going to watch Iron Man 3, no matter who... I'm, I'm, you know, I will always watch MCU movies. So, yeah, you know, and, and when I heard that he had directed, you know, yeah, I was going to go back and watch his earlier work. And I was especially excited when I, real, you know, not realized, but when I, you know remembering that uh, Robert Downey Jr. was the star. But the stuff that Shane Black directs from here on out, I'm not sure I'm going to watch all of it. If it's not like the the kind of thing that, that I, you know, automatically watch anyway. Critic sites, IMDb, and Wikipedia. Excuse me. Okay, so I am skimming reviews. Okay, yeah. So this is this is the quote from a reviewer. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is both an apology for soiling American cinema and surrender to the mass appeal that allowed it to happen. It's a bold experiment, yet only occasionally a great movie. It's the laugh-a-minute repartee of this odd couple that drives the movie far more than the ridiculously overly complicated plot. I mean, I don't know that I completely... I think that... I'd say that in the moment, it's... You know, you can, you can enjoy the repartee as you're watching the movie where the, the plot... Is, is more like when you think back to it, it's, yeah, that you, you can't completely piece it together before you think back to it once the movie has ended. Perhaps a better, better title for the self-referential noir comedy Kiss Kiss Bang Bang would be Wink Wink Nudge Nudge. Say no more. Yeah, so here's one of the, the criticisms. And I don't agree with this, but I do see, like, if this is how you feel about the movie, for sure the movie's going to frustrate you. After about half hour, it became very clear to me that Black had no real idea 
what his story was and didn't particularly care to find out. It's the kind of movie that's twisted enough to play a severed finger for laughs and smart enough to make jokes about grammar. She drives alone. The critic drives alone through the pitch black night. This is about as lowbrow, lowbrow and raunchy as any filmmaker will ever get with an R rating. Yeah, and see, I, again, I can understand this perspective. I don't quite feel that way and agree it, with it, but for sure it's going to be frustrating if you agree with the following. It's not Black's material that misses. It's his refusal to let anyone, especially the audience, take a breather between all those bangs and kisses. I don't think that it's over. I would, I would say that, like, if the movie was half an hour longer, then I think it would be excessive. But because it's, I mean, once again, it's, excuse me, it's 94 and a half minutes if you don't count the end credits. And even, you know, the end credits aren't like huge over, you know, like they're not going to overwhelm you if you do stay through them. So, yeah, I, I think it works. I don't think it pushes it too far. It gets close, but I like that. I think you should. It's, it's a good idea if you can if you can get it to work to go as close as you can without crossing that line. And this also, I I can understand this criticism. Director Shane Black is so determined to break down the fourth wall, he loses sight of all reality. His film is too gimmicky. For its own good. Tis the season for over-the-top violence and delightfully absurdist humor. A delicious postmodern romp through a metafictional crime caper. I loved it. And occasionally funny and entertaining, but man ultimately tries to and cannot maintain the breakneck pace that the first act antes up. Yeah, again, I, I don't really agree with that, but I, yeah, I can see what they mean. And let's see. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is the first movie since 1994's Pulp Fiction, not just to understand a movie violence as a pop culture art form, but to play it like a virtuoso violinist. This is one of Downey's most enjoyable performances and one of Kilmer's funniest. And this is another criticism that I understand. I don't, excuse me, I don't agree with it, but I do think that it's worth, you know, if you watch this video, but you don't read the reviews on your own, I do think this is worth Noting, I was at first entertained, but eventually exhausted by all the movie references, which became maddeningly, maddeningly self-congratulatory. Downey, fresh out of rehab, is perfect for this part. Emaciated and hangdog, a perfect embodiment of the loser who knows he's running out of chances and had better make the most of this one. A clever postmodern noir, equal parts part loving homage and biting parody. Nihilistic, misanthropic, and it just might hate its audience a little, but damn if it doesn't wash out as something exhilarating.
Kiss Kiss Bang Bang could be construed as a kind of oblique mea culpa, but Black is having too much fun to seem all that apologetic. And this is a little, this is a little funny. The this you know this critic gave it zero point five out of four, and wrote don't don't go go. There's a play on the title. Let's. Uh. All affectation and no affect. By the end, the smug artificiality of it all has become well nigh intolerable. I definitely understand where they're coming from. Let's disagree. And. Black's postmodern take lives up to its title, though an added laugh laugh might have said it all. I think it the, the title is absolutely perfect. And I I there's a there's a there's a backstory. The 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 term kiss kiss bang bang has been used by you know in a in a couple of different situations by you know very well-known people if I recall that is written in the IMDb trivia and I'm almost certain I noted to bring that up so I'll get to it very soon excuse me has the bitter irony of someone who used to love the movies until he started making them yeah that is A true comeback for Black and stars Downey and Kilmer. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is smart, smart, fun, fun. Yeah, they really did all, all three of them needed comebacks. I mean, Val Kilmer was in movies, but he wasn't quite as... Yeah. I'm not sure that many people were super excited to see him in movies. This is Black's love letter to the pulps he loved growing up and that inspired his career and his affectation, affection, sorry, can be felt on every frame, not affectation, obviously, that would not make sense. Kiss Kiss is so inside Hollywood, so anxious to bite the hand that fed Black, that it plays like an elaborate prank. Yeah, some... For, don't worry, I, I washed my hands very carefully since the last time I, I went out, and I will wash my hands very carefully before the next time I go out. I, it's not that I'm, excuse me, I realize that when I touch my face, that's a bit of a risk during corona. Excuse me. All three actors give it their all, but Monaghan stands out with sexy yet oddly down-to-earth variation on the Midwest girl gone wrong, thanks partly to a dark, dysfunctional family secret. Yeah, this... I don't agree with the following, but I do think it is worth noting that some felt this way. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang turns into a film that is too ostentatiously pleased with itself. So in love with its own cleverness, it doesn't notice it's darn near worn you out. Now, let's see. 
let's see. Bang knows how to strike a pose, but not how to shoot straight. Hmm. I'm not entirely sure I understand that, but it is. I like the phrasing, even if I don't completely understand it. Yeah, so this is a negative review. I'm just briefly going to go into Downey and Monaghan are great actors, but there's a 10-year difference in age, which makes it hard to believe that they were childhood friends. I, I will say that is that is an issue. And, I mean, I it's there's, a, there's an unwillingness in Hollywood to cast. You know, the, they're, they're not very comfortable with casting actresses who are no longer like 20 or 30 years old you know it, it happens but it's much rarer and it's usually like someone who's like really really like you know i i don't offhand remember the what age i'm blanking on the name um angelina jolie but she's still doing, although, is she doing less movies, though? Maybe. I mean, these days, I'll admit I haven't been paying that much attention to her career. I don't pay that much attention to anyone's career. But, I mean, let's see, recently, I mean, she's going to be in Eternals, and she's she's done the Magnificent. There were, like, two of those, right? She was starting both. But, yeah, you know, like, in the 90s, she was in more movies, I think. You know, and then you have, you know, you, you do have some, you know, like, like, um, I can't believe I'm playing, the, the, she, she played M in the Bond movies. I think it's M. She, she's the, the, you know, she gave Bond orders and, you know, she's, you know, she's not, you know, 20 or 30, but that's you know some some of them do get to but then it's based on acting talent which is i, th I think that's part of why angelina jolie still gets roles she's incredibly talented you know i i know some people don't look past her looks but you just you gotta watch the right movies <sighs> okay it's a major downer so i understand if you don't want to watch it but changeling she is incredible in that movie it is like yeah but even so, you know, even the ones who are still getting roles, Hollywood is unwilling to sexualize women who are no longer, like, 20 or 30. And I, I forget how old uh, Robert Downey Jr. is. But, yeah, you know, the if, if instead of Michelle Monaghan, if, the, if they had cast the role with someone roughly his age, then they would have been a lot more uncomfortable with you know putting her in those outfits throughout the movie now let's see I think I don't think I did end up putting like uh, what's it called like noting that I wanted to bring up let's see yeah so I'm I'm just really quickly I saw someone say that it you know, it was heartless how Harry left behind Richie and, let's see, 
I, f I feel like her name was Chloe, but I'm not sure that it's said in the movie, but it was in the closed captioning. The girl that he's stealing the toy for, and, you know, he does later talk to her over the phone after he goes to L.A. also, but the the reviewer seemed to think that that was, his, that that was Harry's daughter. I agree. If Harry left his daughter... It's, uh, yeah, that's... But I don't think that's supposed to be his daughter, though. I I feel like that... I I always kind of guessed that it was, like, a cousin or something. I don't know. I, I just... I 100% I agree. If that really is his own daughter, then it's, it's really... I don't know, I mean, I guess it's also not great to take a child to L.A., but no, it, it's, I, I guess it's the, the fact that, I think maybe what the reviewer was getting at is, we don't have scenes where Harry is, like, talking about, oh, I really miss my little girl back home, you know. If he left his daughter for several weeks and doesn't talk about missing her, that's, that's fucked up. But I really don't think it's supposed to be his own daughter. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I just, I always kind of assumed that it's, a, you know, yeah, a, a cousin or, or some kind of, yeah. But yeah, that brings us to the IMDb stuff. And yeah, so the taglines are sex, murder, mystery, welcome to the party. And... A bad week in a tough town. And yeah, so so trivia, MDB trivia. As a show of support for Robert Downey Jr.'s recovery from alcohol and drugs, Val Kilmer refused to drink during the entire production. That's really nice of them. That's, excuse me, that, that was, yeah, he, he seems like a, that's, that's a really, yeah. The film was originally titled L-A-P-I and then bang, exclamation point, but Val Kilmer suggested to director Shane Black that Kiss Kiss Bang Bang would have more appeal. And that's, I mean... In, in the movie, you know, when, when Harry enters the, the, you know, superficial L.A. party, he says, you know, the, in the narration, Harry Lockhart, L.A.P.I. And it is a slightly clever because you expect it to be L.A.P.D. or Magnum P.I. Or, you know, we're not used to hearing a city name and then P.I. But... Yeah, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is, it's, it's, I, I think it's a really perfect title. And again, I'll get into why very, very soon now. And this is Robert Downey Jr.'s favorite movie of his own, although I don't know when that's, I mean, that could have been written in 2005, or last week, or any time in between, and I don't know. So, I really, I, I feel like they should be, they should have to put in a date when it's something like that. But anyway, the film was given a standing ovation at the Cannes Film Festival. And let's see. In reference to the Ike, Mike, and Mustard quote, Mike and Ike are boxed candies in mixed colors of black and white. And are also diner slang for salt and pepper shakers. Also, pre 1950s, an Ike, Mike, and Mustard joke was an off color joke, generally with sexual references, that wouldn't be told in polite or mixed company. So, yeah, it, it is like, you know, he's saying the, you know, the white guy, the black guy, and then, yeah. One scene in the film takes place in a club exhibiting 
Living Art, which Robert Downey Jr. once worked as. Because of its modest budget, Warner Brothers granted Joel Silver the distinction of overseeing the film personally, allowing Shane Black to only have to answer to him instead of numerous studio heads. And I think that's part of why the movie is as Shane Blacky as it is. Warner Brothers was willing to produce the movie with a larger budget if Harrison Ford was to play detect the detective. When he passed on it, several other options were briefly considered before Val Kilmer was offered the role. I can kind of see it, but I really don't think it would have worked as well. <sighs> okay, I, I don't... I'm not saying that I think that Harrison Ford is homophobic. I have no idea. But I don't think he would have have done the the you know whatever you do think of the gay jokes they are in the movie and i don't think harrison ford could do them the way val kilmer could i'm not gonna lie if this was the first movie by val kilmer i watched i think i might have thought actually to be fair i don't know i don't know if, you know gay straight bi i have no idea but he's so confident about it you know his character so confident about the gayness, so it's just I, I don't know. The but but I I think Val Kilmer was perfect for it, and I I don't know. I I really don't think that maybe maybe some others could have, but I don't think Harrison Ford. Anyway, let's see. Johnny Knoxville was set to star as Harry Lockhart before being replaced by Robert Downey Jr. I can't see that at all. I'll admit that I haven't seen him in much, but I really, I can't see that at all. As a thank you for putting him back into the A-list with this film, Robert Downey Jr. pushed for Shane Black to be involved in the Marvel franchise. He ultimately wrote and directed Iron Man 3. I, that's, that's a really nice thing to do because it, you know he could easily have said, "Well, I'm I'm an A-lister again. I don't give I don't give a fuck about you. You know you're not so important." But no, he he actually and he was perfect for it. I I don't love. <laughs> there are things about Iron Man two that are definitely frustrating, but I'm kind of glad that a the movie is the way it is because that's part of why um, I can't believe I'm playing on this name uh, John Favreau you know stopped directing Iron Man movies and I'm glad that Shane Black didn't do the second Iron Man movie because I don't think it would have been you know the fact that he did the third one is absolutely perfect it was just there was room for all these things in there that the, the all this Shane Black stuff. Yeah. I don't usually usually I don't always bring up the, the goofs section, but occasionally it's just So this is a continuity goof. The license plate of the car being pursued changes from 3D W0489 in one shot to 3MX0149 in the next. It wouldn't be so easily notable, but the characters are talking about writing it down. So you're like, you're, you're focusing on, and it's like, oh, that's a, that's, that's a good point, yeah. Oh, that's right. That's Lawrence Fishburne's voice as the bear in the Gennaro's beer commercial. Wow. Let's see. Following the bad... Sorry, this is from Wikipedia. Following the bad critical reception of The Long Kiss Goodnight and a rejection letter from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, Shane Black decided he would attempt something out 
of the action genre. Following the example of James L. Brooks, Black attempted to make a romantic comedy. So something a la, you know, James L. Brooks made the, ah, what's it called? As good as it gets, yeah. So yeah, Black attempted to make a romantic comedy, a quirky story of two kids in L.A. Brooks, Brooks liked Black's first draft, but felt his later attempts were losing focus. Trying to salvage what he had liked, Brooks suggested Black imagine Jack Nicholson from As Good As It Gets playing Nicholson's role from Chinatown. This led Black to add action elements. I said, you know, fuck it, I have to put murder in it. And reworked the screenplay, adding the character of Detective Gay Perry. Let's see. Um... Yeah, I just wanted to... I gotta admit, I did not, I had not expected that it started out as an as good as it gets kind of thing. And then, oh, but, you know, imagine if instead of as good as it gets, Nicholson, you have Chinatown Nicholson. It's like, oh, sure, I'll make Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Just, But on the other hand, like, once you know that, it's like, that makes, that kind of makes perfect sense. Because the, the romantic comedy aspect in here you can kind of see how it started out as a kind of as good as it gets kind of thing. And that was everything that I had noted, and I have been going for almost three hours now, so I guess that's probably a pretty good, excuse me. Let's see, is there anything left that I think... I should say, let's see, I'm going to very quickly look over the cover. I guess... Yeah, just real quick, when I took out the disc to put it in earlier, I was like, oh, but there's only one kiss, even though there are the two bangs. But now that I look, there's a kiss on the back of the DVD. I almost dropped it like a putz. That's, that's, yeah, it's, it's in there, both kisses and both bangs. But, um. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I don't think I have anything left to add. Let me just real quick, so I don't remember it right after I'm done. think I think if hypothetically you know, I'm I'm not saying I I don't think that they could just do it, you know, play the exact roles again today. And actually, I'm not one hundred percent certain if Hesbal Kilmer. I know a few years ago he had like a thing he had where where he couldn't quite. Like, they would, they would, like, dub over his voice in some movies because he had, like, an accident. I actually don't know if he 
if he still has that. And anyway, but what I'm what I'm getting at is, if Shane Black at some point felt that it might be fun to do an ongoing series where, like, let's see, yeah, just like I don't know, ten episodes instead of instead of one ninety minute movie. 10 30 minute episodes or something of just I'm, I'm not saying Val Kilmer and Robert Downey Jr. playing these two characters but something like that just you know bickering trying to deal with corpses that they're being framed for and yeah just Yeah, the the um, you know that that kind of thing. Just I I'm not sure I'll ever tire of it. It's it's just so unbelievably funny when they're arguing, you know, bickering and trying to figure out where to go with the corpse and how to best you know and and all this stuff and like every like just constantly arguing over every single little thing and yeah just i i really really love the the the, the writing and acting and they have such great chemistry just yeah they're actually one of the YouTube videos I watched was the the what's it called the yeah the the two actors you know basically sitting there talking like I guess it was sort of an interview but I think I guess they were maybe interviewing each other or something and they were constantly joking and like they just they seem to really like you know these ad libs like cracking jokes together both of them you know both like trying to come across as like smooth and suave but also like saying ridiculous things to, to get the other one to crack up and all these things and just you know it's it's there you see it on screen and it's it was there when they were just working together in general you know you, there, there are a lot of interviews where like the cast are together and you kind of say oh, you know they they respect each other and they're glad that they got to do this movie together but there's you know t together if, if they don't have a script they don't necessarily know what to do but here it's like no i mean you could i'm hypothetically if the two of them had like a camera guy follow them around for 94 and a half unbroken minutes and then, you know, and they were like trying to get each other to crack up with, with jokes and such. I'm not saying it would be as entertaining as the movie, but I don't think it would be like it would it would be incredibly watchable still, you know, because they're just they're so good together. And it's just like you can tell that all of them, you know, the the three leads and others as well, they all understand what the what they're working on here that they, they know that they 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 realize how to play it they they get how to excuse me they they yeah it doesn't excuse me they're not just reciting lines they they actually understand why this is written the way it is and like the the kind of yeah i mean honestly based on this movie you know val kilmer whether he's supposed to be gay straight by you know whatever whether we're supposed to know at all he's incredibly entertaining in this as uh it's, sorry let me finish that thought for he could play other detectives and you know some people would maybe say, ah, oh, but, you know, don't make it, 
maybe he shouldn't play a gay character that time, you know, he, he wouldn't have to, he could play, he could play it straight, as it were, but he just, he's really, really entertaining as a, as a Victor. I, again, I haven't watched that many of his movies, you know, I, I don't really know, maybe he has played a detective elsewhere, and he's also great there, but just, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a movie where all three of the leads, I would watch, like, a movie that was primary, like, that, that didn't have the other two in it. Like, I would watch a movie where it was only Harmony, only Perry, only Harry, you know. They, they're incredibly fun, both together and apart, and, yeah. I just realized the, the, whoops, I apparently did not, let's see, I'm, I think I know what the, let's see, I'm going to see if I can't find Let's see, here's the, yeah, so one of the, let's see, yeah, here we go. The thing about why it's called Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, I guess I did not note it, but here we go. From IMDb Trivia. The phrase Kiss Kiss Bang Bang appeared in the 1960s as an overseas slang for spy movies, especially James Bond movies. It was popular in Europe and Japan. It first appeared as a film title for a 1966 spy comedy made in Spain with Italian financing. It was also the title of famed critic Pauline Kael's second published collection of reviews. Kael wrote that she chose the words as her title because they are perhaps the briefest statement imaginable of the basic appeal of movies. And, yeah, it is... I, I agree with her on that, and it is, it is just perfect, because that is... This movie is why we love movies. You know, it's a love letter to so many movies, and it just... The, the, you can't... I love books, but it's just not quite the same to read this kind of dialogue when you can watch people perform it, you know, and just, yeah, it's, it's such a great, and, and the, I feel like I keep bringing up that in in these reviews that a movie I've done a video on could be a great video game. I swear I'm not trying to make it a thing. It's not that I want to bring it up. It's it's not like I feel I have to bring it up every single time. It's just kind of organically come up. I do think that you could make a really great video game out of this this sort of thing you know i like like a an adventure game maybe point and click or not not an action adventure game but you know something yeah yeah like something perhaps similar to i'm sorry i've played a lot of point and click games but the one I, that that i've played the most and the one i remember the most vividly is the uh, one second. The Curse of Monkey Island is what it's called, the third Monkey Island game. And yeah, I you know something like that. You know, for those who don't know, The Curse of Monkey Island has a lot of fun with the tropes of the pirate story. You know, and yeah, I think that you could do something like that. You know, 
yeah, something very much like this movie using that same, you know, formula that also has, you know, fourth wall breaks and absurdist humor and, and such. Yeah, I, th I think, I'm not saying you have to make, you know, maybe not the exact same because it already, I don't know that you could make, I don't know if it will work quite as well as a direct, but like, if like, and I don't know if Shane Black, I figure he's probably busy with, you know, but if someone like had had very similar ideas, I would love to see someone write, a, you know, yeah, do, do a video game like very, very similar to, as, yeah, as a marriage between The Curse of Monkey Island and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang the movie. I think that would, yeah. And that is, in fact, everything. So, once again, I hope you have a, I hope, you know, I wish you happy holidays, and I will be making at least one more video before the new year, so that's when I'll wish you a happy new year. But, I hope you enjoyed watching, as I definitely enjoy watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.